This is the uh, first session of the pre-hospital and airway forum, and we have a debate for you just to get you all stimulated. And um, so get on Twitter. I've had a few Twitter comments already about this debate. It's a cricoid pressure debate about whether we should be using cricoid pressure. There's got a number of airway experts uh, on the forum who all have a different opinion. But uh, the debate's going to be 10 minutes aside. We have uh, two anaesthetists who are going to uh, argue the pro versus con. They both work in pre-hospital medicine, motorsports medicine as well. You've uh, heard uh, one of them speak already. Um, so I think it'd be very exciting. So um, those of you on Twitter, let's uh, uh, start the conversation. Everyone outside who's not attending the conference is watching this debate very carefully. Use the hashtag SmackAir for this debate. And I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Brent May, who uh, is a, a Melbourne anaesthetist, also uh, is a motorsports medicine uh, physician, and uh, he's going to argue the pro side. So please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Just wait for the slides. Wow, it's a, quite a nice introduction, really, and thank you, Min. Uh, good to invite me along. It was nice to listen to John talk a bit earlier. It's a, um, a good experience being here. Don't let it um, wreck you when I hit you with that pressure. Don't let it wreck you when I hit you with that pressure. Well, he said to make it interesting, and, and the topic can be a little bit dry. So the idea was just to bring you a little bit more of a mood into the... Uh, and hopefully bring in the crowds as well. Um... But really, always sell off with disclosure, and I have no financial conflicts of interest with this presentation at all. Um, but in my spare time, I have to disclose, I do spend my time picking up race uh, bike riders off the ground um, because they're always making mistakes. And some of you say, oh, not that relevant unless you were listening to John earlier, and as much as they make mistakes, he's going to make a lot more today uh, straight after me. And I was talking to Min, and he said, oh, how long do I need to speak for? And he said, oh, it just lasts as long as um, John will last when he's on the racetrack riding his bike in a race. So does it work? Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> but we're all here to talk, and we're all going to try and get a bit of an idea of what's going to happen with cryo pressure in the future and where we are standing now. And this is going to be a really dynamic area. Um, because the evidence is kind of a little bit crap, to be honest. Um, but there is stuff there, and we just have to de decipher it and figure out where we should be at the moment. So the background's a bit boring. You know, it was first uh, described by Munro. It was more about protecting against gastric insufflation when you're bagging masking. But then Selick did this little thing uh, about 12 patients in 1961, and that sort of changed history. Um, since then, it's been a little bit more developed. Vanna did some studies on pressure and, and it's now been written into difficult airway algorithm, algorithms looking at um, the optimum pressure. And it's somewhere between 30 and 40, um, and it's to prevent aspiration. And that's what we're looking at. It's about preventing aspiration. The complexities of it, the, the teaching, the, the possible side effects are one part, but the whole idea of it is to prevent aspiration. So why use cricoid? Well, all the cool kids use it. You can either be one of these guys that uses pressure, uses the force, uh, and wears black, or you can be one of the guys that kisses his sister. <laughs> so what does it do? What does cricoid pressure do? It occu uh, sorry, occludes the conduit. It reduces the risk of aspiration, and it improves outcomes. So there's a really delicate, quite elegant little study um, done under MRI in 2009, published, that really changed the way a lot of us think about the whole cricoid pressure argument. There's lots of discussion about um, location of the esophagus, how the cricoid um, ring doesn't necessarily ob um, obstruct it when you put pressure on it. But what this study showed that the cricoid ring, the hypopharynx, the, and the upper end of the esophagus actually work as a single anatomical unit. So it's absolutely irrelevant where the top of that, um, the cricoid ring and that uh, top of the esophagus lie, because as an anatomical unit, when you compress 
under MRI conditions, in an anaesthetised adult, you press down, it actually occludes that esophagus. It decreased the diameter by 35%, as well as uh, it completely obliterated the lumen. And it was effective both midline and, and out of midline. So looking at sort of a side view, uh, you can see that the, the cricoid ring's there, the esophagus runs down here, you can see occlusion uh, about the level of C5. Uh, and this amazingly matches one of Selick's earlier uh, radiological exams regarding the same thing. And this is more from the MRI. So you can see there that the cricoid ring, the esophagus, you push back, it, it occludes it. Even in the lateral uh, position, it still occludes it. And this is further down, you can see the esophagus is still occluded, despite it, the um, esophagus being offline. So it does occlude the conduit. So we've finished that part of the debate, fixed. Next bit is, does it reduce the risk of aspiration? A little bit harder to prove. There's lots of cadaver studies that show it either does nothing or does uh, reduce the risk of aspiration. There has been lots of case reports of, um, on release of cricoid, massive amount of gastric fluid comes up. Um, and there's never been a good study that shows that cricoid pressure increases the risk of aspiration. So at the very, very least, it's non-inferior in that, in that way. And does it improve outcomes? Well, that's where we get a little bit more muddy. It's a very difficult topic to study, especially considering the current climate. Um, the risk of aspiration is low, somewhere in the region of 1 to 3,000 to 1 in 5,000, even up to 1 in 10,000 with current techniques. Um, so you need to do a randomised control trial on a huge number of high-risk patients to get an outcome. But maybe it improves outcomes and other things. So looking at a study from Victoria, there was a rapid sequence induction on, in severe traumatic brain injuries. And I'm sure uh, Professor Steve Bernard, who's in the second row here, can talk to you about this later. But I put to you that it's not actually oxygen and CO2 that fixes this. It was the fact they all got cricoid pressure. And then there's the naysayers, the people that just don't get it. They saw it on Twitter, don't use cricoid anymore, and they've stopped using it. They say it causes airway deformation. Well, what, what does it do? It reduces the glottic opening, it may move the glottic opening and make it more difficult to intubate the patient. So now comes the practical component. What I want you to do is find your cricoid ring, on yourself, and when I say let it go, you let it go. Let it go. Is anyone still holding their cricoid? No? Excellent. Okay, so that part's over as well. If, he, if it's causing you trouble, you let it go. Problem solved. How quick was that? One, two seconds? So you can release the cricoid if you need to. Increased risk of aspiration. What a load of crap. People talk about the reduction in the lower esophageal sphincter um, pressure, the barrier pressure. Cricoid was never designed to reduce the risk of reflux at the lower esophageal sphincter. It's about the upper esophageal sphincter. It's about reducing the risk of aspiration. Once you've got that tube in, you put the cuff up, who cares where the fluid is, as long as it's below that upper esophageal sphincter. And there's no evidence that it's inferior to no cricoid pressure in re reducing aspiration. So then we've got the other issues. And this is the stuff you see in social media. It kills kittens. It's not simple to do. It causes neck harm. And it's always involved something to do with Star Wars. But I put to you, it's more than that. Every time you use cricoid, a kitten gets a kiss. <laughs> I don't always use cricoid, but when I do, I actually teach somebody how to use it. It's one of the only things I've ever seen discussed on social media and out of social media where people are willing to just give up rather than teaching people how to use it right. Can't teach it, don't bother we'll get rid of it because people don't do it correctly, rather than what we all look at, which is an, ed an education intervention to try and improve outcomes. 
And that's the alternative to neck, neck damage. Nobody wants that. So we can stop doing cricoid and reduce our care. Even vets use cricoid pressure to reduce aspiration, and they've got good evidence on it. In One neurological minute. emergencies, One uh, using cricoid pressure reduces aspiration in dogs. And then you've got the medico-legal component. When you're standing there in court, in front of the judge, what are you going to say? What is expected of you in your community, in your medical community? Are you going to say, oh yeah, read it on Twitter, heard it at a conference, so I didn't use it anymore? There is evidence from the UK where it's been said that we cannot assert that cricoid pressure is not effective until trials have been performed, especially as it is an integral part of an anaesthetic technique being associated with reduction in maternal death through aspiration since 1960s. Nice long sentence. What it means is the anaesthetist lost, got done, and the patient's family won and lost a lot of money. In the US, closed claims, closed claims court um, findings found that if you caused aspiration without cricoid pressure, you had to pay a lot more than if you'd used cricoid pressure. So summary, the aim is to prevent aspiration, superior and definitely non-inferior. It's easily reversible. It's your peers' expectation. But more evidence is needed. And just remember, you're Australian. <laughs> <laughs> at the race car. <laughs> <laughs> right, now for the uh, con side is Dr John Hines, who gave a fantastic talk just before lunch, uh, pre-hospital an anaesthetist intensive care physician, and he'll be arguing that uh, we should get rid of cricoid pressure. Thank you. Excellent. Cricoid pressure. Now, many of you have been following this argument on Twitter, I'm sure much as I have, and have occasionally read something that's caused you to go completely apeshit and do this to your computer. Uh, <laughs> This argument is going to be going round and round and round in circles, and to be quite honest, I don't really care if you use cricoid pressure or not, because I'm here for nefarious reasons. I'm here to sell you a drug that we've been working on in Ireland for a number of years. <laughs> this is Cricolol. Cricolol is a new development in airway management. So this was my plan, get invited to an international conference with a captive audience and sell you this great new drug. Because we're quite good at appraising drugs and therapies. These are all drugs and therapies we've appraised over recent years, and thrown in the bin for some of them. So Cricolol was a herbal remedy developed by an Irish guy called Seamus O'Monroe in 1774. It's Seamus. <laughs> and it was rebranded by Seamus O'Selick, chap from Galway in 61. Um, he conducted an original study on 26 patients in one hospital, non-randomized, non-standardized, took a guess at the dose and gave it. And Seamus was... <laughs> Seamus was loving this because it was then adopted into every set of guidelines throughout Ireland for difficult airway management and rapid sequence induction. He got himself a Ferrari out of it, as you can see. Uh, if you're administering Cricolol, you need a dedicated assistant. You give 10 milligrams before induction, 30 milligrams during induction. But to be quite honest, we don't know what the dose is in the syringe. To be honest, we don't know. If you just draw this stuff up and you give some, uh, we don't know how much is in an ampule. This was a study done by Seamus O'Kozial, a guy from Cork, um, looking at 105 perioperative nurses giving Cricolol during the induction of anesthesia. And really nobody knew how much they were giving. Only 5% gave the right dose. Great drug. Um, so we've been using this stuff in Ireland for half a century. We've never done a randomized control on it showing benefit, but it's fine. We do have some BSE data. data. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with BSE data, this is bullshit surrogate endpoint data. So <clears throat> we know it's good if you're dead. Um, if you're having an MRI scan and you're a volunteer, it's quite good. And you're probably thinking at this point, well, that doesn't really sound great, but at least I hope it's safe. And there are a few problems. As one of the guys trying to sell this, I am bound to tell you about some of the problems. So it does make airway difficult more management if you administer cricolol during your induction. You know, it causes airway compression and most patients' airway obstruction in about half. It reduces your chance of getting the tube in. There's a study by uh, Patio Levitan, uh, who's a long-lost relative of Rich's. Um, it increases your chance of vomiting and regurgitating. 
And it is a fairly narrow therapeutic window, so side effects include breaking the airway, um, and your esophagus might explode. <laughs> and again, we don't know what dose you're giving in the amp. Whenever I'm doing a difficult airway, what I like to do is tie up my only expert assistant giving this drug throughout the whole course of the intubation. It's great. <laughs> so, Crankalol, are you interested in buying it? If I came as a drug rep, uh, there's no evidence for it in randomized trials. We've got some BSE data. Side effects include airway collapse in most patients, complete obstruction in about half. It makes it more difficult to intubate, and it causes actual physical harm. Crankalol is also available as suppositories, by the way. Um, <laughs> Because, to be perfectly honest, <laughs> for all the good it does, you might as well stick it up your arse. <laughs> now, cricoid pressure, just to be serious, from one three pet hates of mine, I use cricoid pressure, I can just take it off if it's difficult. Well, that's what Selleck did. He put cricoid pressure on, did laryngoscopy, took it off, and resulted in the highest incidence ever reported of gastric regurgitation in any study ever done. Not a great strategy. But where are the trained assistant? This is one of our trained assistants. Um, during a high-fidelity sim, this guy had done the airway course, knew how to put on cricoid pressure. In the heat of the moment, he's standing on the wrong side, facing backwards with his hand upside down. Probably not great cricoid pressure. Likewise, a colleague of mine asked a midwife who had been trained in the application of cricoid pressure, had done her airway crash, uh, thing, during a crash uh, caesarean section for cricoid. And she asked him which cupboard it was kept in. Not great. This is another one. I don't believe in cricoid pressure, but I'm afraid to not use it because of the guidelines, the big scary guidelines, like the Difficult Airway Society guidelines. Well, if you actually read these things, it talks about stuff about wakening the patient up or continuing anesthesia. These are not options for us as critical care physicians. We can't wake the patient up, so these, are, these algorithms aren't relevant. What the Difficult Airway Society does say is that you should have written guidelines for each department, and any individual practitioner can make a judgment about which equipment or technique to use, and is quite entitled to do any. If you really want to protect yourself, what you should do is form institutional guidelines that exclude the use of cricoid pressure, which is what Sydney Hems has done. So if you're voting against cricoid pressure today, you think Cliff Reed is a dick, and that's quite a strong statement for you people to be coming up with. <laughs> I have to follow the guidelines, though. They're written down. I have to follow them. We've heard this before in a number of occasions through history. Befal is Befal. Orders are orders. This is what the Nazis used. Uh, <laughs> To justify their atrocities at Outswitch, we were just following orders. Now, many of you are familiar with Goodwin's Law, an online discussion as it grows longer. The probability of comparison involving Nazis or Hitler approaches one. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached that time in the cricoid pressure argument. So if you vote for cricoid pressure, it leads me to one of two logical conclusions. Number one, you're an idiot. <laughs> or number two, you're a Nazi. And if anyone is interested in buying some Cricolol, we do have a trade stand available in the main area. So I shall leave you with that. All right. Um, thank you, John. All right, so we're going to uh, vote, see uh, who's going to uh, take the debate. I've put out a question on Twitter. And then we'll see what the audience thinks. So for those who think that they will still use cricoid pressure, could you put hands up? Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And for those who think that um, next time you do RSI, we can say this is absolutely useless, this is not going to protect this patient at all, I'm not going to use cricoid pressure. Oh, not as, not as strong a th <laughs> response as I thought. What about, I How don't many... know what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty even. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How okay. Many, how many of those people that aren't going to use cricoid pressure actually do airways? <laughs> Three. <laughs> <laughs> and just as a matter of interest, how many people change their minds as a result of this? Because I suspect it's nobody. Please don't. <laughs> Please don't change your minds. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you very much. Please thank our speaker.